Welcome back to another episode of 40 Facts About the 40K Universe. I am your host, Gersh1, and today we're going to be talking about the three major human civilizations that resisted the Imperium of Man during the Great Crusade. If you're new to the channel, subscribe. We post Warhammer 40K lore videos every single day. If you have any suggestions, please comment down below. And if you guys enjoy our content, thank our patrons on Patreon. If you guys want to support us, the link is down in the description. But with that said... Let's get into 40 facts on the human civilizations of the Dark Age of Technology. The human empire that predated the Imperium of Man was a marvel of human technology and power in the Milky Way galaxy. When the Age of Strife devastated the Human Federation, many of humanity's planets were completely cut off from one another by warp storms, or engulfed by wars created by the Men of Iron or the Psyker Epidemic. Unfortunately, the majority of humanity was in ruin, and the empire collapsed. When the Emperor of Mankind embarked on his Great Crusade to rescue and unify the scattered human planets during the Great Crusade, his armies encountered ancient human civilizations that adapted to the isolation and managed to form their own empires. The Emperor of Mankind would not settle for anything less than full compliance by these human empires, and those that resisted would be utterly destroyed. There were three major human civilizations that proved harder than expected to fold over into the Imperium of Man, with most of their people and territories completely annihilated by the end of the war. The Interrex were a highly advanced interstellar human civilization that existed across some 30 star systems at the time of the Great Crusade in the 31st millennium. The Interrex, unlike the Imperium of Man, had decided that the best way to deal with intelligent alien species was not to exterminate them or make war upon them, but to try and coexist with them. In fact, the Interrex had become the close allies and nominal overlords of a simian alien species called the Kynebrak, who they had integrated into their own society. They were first encountered by the Luna Wolves during the Great Crusade, following the Legion's war against the world of the Megarachnids called Murder by the Imperium, which was actually a prison planet for the vicious alien species. The Megarachnids had been imprisoned on Murder by the Interrex after being defeated in a terrible war and deprived of all their spacefaring technologies. The technology and science of the Interrex was in many ways more advanced than even that of the Imperium's, but was not as strongly focused on waging war. Devoted to fighting chaos, which they referred to as Chaos, with a K, they regarded the Imperium 63rd Expeditionary Fleet skeptically, as they thought that the Imperium might be allies of Chaos. The Interrex's government was in diplomatic talks with Horus and his peers, when Erebus of the Wordbearers, a space marine chaplain, tainted by the powers of Chaos, infiltrated an Interrex Museum of Technology called the Hall of Devices. The Hall of Devices housed alien artifacts and weapons. Erebus stole the Kynebrake blade called Anatham and rigged the building to explode, which only affirmed the Interrex's initial fear about the Imperial forces and inaugurated an unfortunate war between the two human cultures. Fighting broke out between the Space Marines and Interrex forces on their worlds of Zembia until Horus was successfully evacuated off planet. It should be noted that the Interrex warriors were quite a match for the Luna Wolf Space Marines under the War Master Horus's command. The Interrex ultimately became enemies of the Imperium after the hostilities between the two human civilizations. The Interrex knew the blade that was stolen was connected to Chaos and concluded that the Imperium must be allied with Chaos. Unknown to Horus, Erebus of the Wordbearer Legion had already turned to the worship of the ruinous powers of Chaos. The powers of the Warp had informed Erebus and his Primarch Lorgar that if they wished to bring Horus over to the side of Chaos, then they would need this blade. The Interrex civilization was ultimately wiped out by the Luna Wolves following their commencement of hostilities between the two human factions on the night Erebus stole the artifact. The Interrex had incredibly advanced technology available to them. At first glance, many of Horus's warriors believed that the Interrex were aliens in the shape of centaurs, 
Later, it was found that the Centaur base was a form of mobile fighting platform used by Interrex warriors. They would walk into the base and find a warrior who looked much like the mythological representation of a centaur with increased mobility. They also used a type of bow or crossbow that Horus' space marines rode off as decorative parade weapons until a skirmish revealed that they could emit bolts of laser light fully capable of punching through even a space marine's armor. The Interrex also had automated drones throughout the society that were akin to advanced artificial intelligences as opposed to the Imperium's less humanitarian use of cybernetic servitors. However, the Mechanicum chose to use servitors because of humanity's prior experience with the Iron Man of the Dark Age of Technology. Perhaps one of the foremost commandments of the Adeptus Mechanicus, Cult of the Machine, was that no truly artificial intelligence could be created, so instead they used partially organic, mind-wiped cyborgs to serve as laborers and soldiers thus solidifying and destroying the technology used by the Interax. The Olamic Quietude was a technologically advanced cybernetic human civilization that had been founded during the Dark Age of Technology and had survived through the long years of the Age of Strife. Over 15,000 standard years, the Quietude had survived by merging themselves so completely with their advanced technology as a result of possible Xeno influence that there was little left of them that could be considered truly human. The Quietude lived in vast and deep techno hive cities protected by an artificially extended ice cap on their unnamed homeworld, an otherwise lifeless planet. The technological level of the Quietude was very high, at least equal to if not more advanced than that of the Imperium of Man. The people of the Quietude could barely be considered human by the time they were encountered by the Imperium. Through ritualized surgery, from an early age, they incorporated cybernetic enhancements into their bodies, even more complete than the tech adepts of the Adeptus Mechanicus. By the time the members of the Quietude reached maturity, the only remaining organic parts of their body were the brain, skull, eyes, and spinal column. These biological components were kept alive within a purple nutrient fluid pumped through their bodies like blood from the powerful humanoid robotic chassis. Citizens of the Quietude wore silver electronic hoods over their heads, and instead of faces, had holographic masks that displayed an image of a human face that could display different facial expressions such as anger. Underneath this, visible when their body shorted out due to damage or death, was simply a fleshless skull, eyeballs staring from lidless sockets. Little is known about the Quintude's culture, but it is believed that they were very mechanical in both their modes of thought and operations. They were interconnected to each other and to their technology by a vast digital social network that allowed each member of the Quintude to very quickly assess threats and provide the best possible response to them. Despite having replaced most of their organic bodies with cybernetic forms, the Quietude considered themselves to be both the epitome of human development as well as the only rightful heirs to the human future. They found the defenders of the Imperium of Man to be pretenders to this mantle despite their origins on the human birth world of Terra. And when first contact with the Imperium was made, the people of the Quietude did not hesitate to initiate brutal hostilities to wipe out away a threat to what they saw as their own human ideal. In this way, the Quietude was a mirror image of the Imperium of Man. The Quietude's technology and deadly efficiency in their arts of war allowed them to survive through the turbulence of the Age of Strife. Apart from their space fleet, they possessed three main types of highly advanced cybernetic warriors. The smallest and lightest were the Graysels, roughly equivalent in size to a normal human, but far more deadly due to their cybernetic enhancements. The Robusts were larger, at least the size of a space marine. Super Robusts, the elites of the Quietude's military force, were enormous, two-headed and four-armed cyborgs, twice the size of the Robust, armed with a variety of close combat weapons, including hooked tool war blades and huge kinetic hammers. The super robust could be driven into a close combat berserker frenzy by stimulants injected into their organic central nervous system by their robotic bodies. All of the different types of Olmatic warriors had highly advanced sensory systems. The Olamic warriors carried advanced weaponry as well. 
Most had gravitic rifles that used a powerful gravitic pulse to propel an ultra-dense projectile at incredible speeds, which would easily smash through power armor. They also carried fusion-based heat beams, perhaps similar to melta weapons, that made no noise except an explosion crack from whatever they hit. The Olamic super-robust kinetic hammers were similar in effect to the Imperial Thunder Hammer and could slay an armored Astarte in a single titanic blow. All quietude warriors were armored by overlapping plates of woven steel and emitted gravitic force fields whose potency and maximum points of strength could be quickly adapted to maximize protection against different types of threats. The Olamic warriors' humanoid bodies were generally resistant to any damage that did not compromise their remaining biological components. The quietude homeworld was protected by a heavily armed and well-protected orbital facility known as the Instrument that was perhaps the size of a small moon and embedded within a titanic gravitic dock. Their ice-shielded cities on the surface of the world were defended by towers bristling with powerful energy weapons that could destroy heavy tanks and massive numbers of infantry in a single blast, and by vast numbers of robust cyborgs. Near the end of the Great Crusade, some time before the Council of Nicaea, the 40th Expeditionary Fleet encountered the Quietude. The Quietude attacked the 40th Fleet in two separate actions, attempting to drive it out of their space. In the second of these actions, the Quietude captured the crew of the Imperial warship, the Quietude then ignored the Imperial ultimatum to cease hostilities and return the crew, instead subjecting them to torture and vivisection to extract information. The Quietude claimed that the information extracted from these unlucky subjects proved that the Imperium were simply pretenders to the heritage of mankind, and that when the Age of Strife ended, the Olamic Quietude would return to the wider galaxy and take their rightful place as the true inheritors of the human race. Naturally, finding such a contradiction of the Imperial truth unacceptable, but evenly matched by the formidable force of the Quietude, the 40th Expedition grudgingly called for the aid of the Space Marine Legion in the form of the Space Wolf's third great company to assist in the assault on the Quietude's homeworld. The Space Wolves began the attack by assaulting the orbital facility above the planet, and despite the Quietude's martial reputation and advanced technology, they easily overcame the formidable onboard defenses composed of all the robust cybernetic troops. The 40th Expeditionary Fleet then began an orbital bombardment of the planet below, which proved ineffective against the ice cap that the Quietude had extended over their hive cities. Imperial Army ground forces found the going much more difficult when they landed, despite being supported by the Titans and Super Heavy Tanks with the strange, lamp-like beam weapons mounted on the Quintude's defense towers, extracting a heavy toll from the Imperial forces. After sustaining heavy casualties, the Imperial Army forces were withdrawn on the request of the Space Wolves, much to the anger of the Imperial Army commanders involved in the assault. Instead of another frontal assault, the Space Wolves used the vast orbital facilities they have captured to unleash an orbital bombardment, forcing the space station out of orbit. It fell into the world's atmosphere and smashed into the Quietude cities with a power of tens of thousands of nuclear weapons, breaking through the ice shield and inflicting catastrophic damage. This unconventional assault was followed by a full-scale attack on the now burning cities from a combined Astarte and Imperial Army force that brutally eradicated the Quietude and purged all trace of their presence from the galaxy. It was later discovered that the space station, or instrument as the Quietude called it, that the Space Wolves had dropped on the planet, was instead of a weapon or military base, a vast archive that contained the last records of all Quietude culture and technology, causing it to be lost to mankind forever. The Manakian Commonwealth is a conglomerate of advanced and populated worlds that lie at the border of both the Segmentum Obscurus and the Ultima Segmentum. The Manakian system which lies at the heart of the commonwealth, which has given its name to the surrounding subsector, and likely founded during mankind's dark age of technology. The three worlds of Manichaea survived the horrors of the old night relatively intact, its technology still advanced and its disciplined population numbering in the hundreds of millions. However, somewhere during the age of strife, the system 
also fell prey to the Mitu conglomerate, a Xeno empire of great strength which ruled over much of the Coronid deeps. The Mitu were a cabal of several psychically empowered Xeno species believed to have evolved from the common stock. Technologically advanced and warp capable, their pocket empire soon grew to subjugate other worlds from whom they periodically demanded a calling of the population, a tribute of flesh to provide them. It was believed with the basic components to construct their technologies. Although enjoying a semblance of freedom and self-governance, which made their rule less harsh than the brutal slavery maintained by Orcs or Eldar, the Mitu controlled the system entirely, tracking down and rooting out any new psychers and forbidding any attempts at spaceflight. It is unclear for how many standard decades or even centuries the worlds of the future Manachian Commonwealth suffered under that regime. But the overlordship of this vile breed of Xenos was brought to an end by the armies of the Great Crusade. The war the Imperium would fight to end the Mitu conglomerate would be a protracted and bloody one essentially fought as a series of brutal close quarter boarding engagements in the void, interspersed with sudden and world shattering planetary assaults on both sides. This campaign would mobilize no less than several expeditionary fleets and three legions of the Legionus Astartes, amongst them the Imperial Fist of the Primarch Rogaldorn and hundreds of cohorts of solar auxilia. Most of the worlds of the conglomerate would eventually be purged by Exterminatus. But for the human populated, Manichaea system, the Imperium would fight hard. For the masses who had lived so long under the oppression of inhuman intelligence and the constant threat of being harvested or culled, Imperial compliance was taken up with open arms. Due to its long-standing ties and common history, the three inhabited worlds of Manichaea system were established as a commonwealth under the authority of a single Imperial commander. The seat of power and governance would be on Manachaea at Hive Ilium, where the noble partitions of House Beckett would act as Lord Protectors of the Manachian Commonwealth. Here from the Palace of Light, as it would soon be called, the vast wealth and manpower of the Commonwealth would labor for the Imperium of Man, quickly becoming a powerhouse of military and industrial activity. Manachaea prospered, serving as a linchpin of commerce and trade for the entire region. This prominence caused the Commonwealth to become a regional capital of the entire subsector. At the dawn of the 31st millennium, Manachia was a shining beacon of imperial civilization in the northern stellar reaches of the Imperium, a powerful, autonomous pocket empire that would utterly be loyal to the liberators of the Great Crusade and concentrated much of the military might of the Imperium in this region of space. As a sizable and technologically advanced domain, the Manachian Commonwealth would muster a very large military force for its own defense. This strength was again concentrated around two major star systems of the subsector, the Commonwealth itself and the naval base located at Port Maul. Both were in their own right strongholds of military might that would resist major incursions of Xenos. It is likely that if the enemy had not been in an Astarte, the traitor rampage would be stopped at Manachia. In fact, few regions outside the heartland of the Segmentum Solar could claim to be as well protected as the Manachian Commonwealth. At the dawn of the 31st millennia, the Commonwealth was a bulwark of military might, charged with protection of much of the Segmentum surrounding it and constituting undoubtedly the single most powerful faction inside the Coronid Deeps. As a standard peacekeeping and rapid response force, Port Maul and the Manachian system could field no less than 93 solar auxilia cohorts, which amount to a notional strength of some 3,860,000 fully armed, equipped, and disciplined fighters, equipped with the highest standards of the Imperium's human soldiery. As solar auxilia, they were trained and experienced both in void combat and planetary defense operations, and represented a significant military force even set against the might of the fearsome Legionus of Stardi. Among these solar auxilia cohorts also figured some elite formations such as the 905th cohort, the Ash Scorpions, recruited from the savage worlds of Lath. Alongside this elite army, the worlds of the Manachian Commonwealth were also intended to raise their own planetary defense militia. In truth, the Commonwealth emergency defense planning 
had been specially designed to quickly raise, equip, and muster tens of millions of militiamen. Such was the strength and accuracy of their planning that even the full mobilization of a militia would have no effect on the massive industrial output of the subsector. The continued productivity of its citizens had also empowered the Commonwealth to stockpile a considerable quantity of war materials, making the Commonwealth's troops one of the very best equipped fighting forces in the entire Imperium. In case of more serious menaces, the Commonwealth could also count on the limited presence of some members of the Legionus Astartes, the Imperial Fists. While refusing to submit themselves to the authority of the mere human commanders, the Imperial Fist had doubtlessly heavily improved Manakian's defenses, dispatching several advisors to training regiments and lending their experiences in counter-siege warfare to the Commonwealth's authority, as to better improve existing fortifications and tactical doctrines in case of attack. The troops raised from the Manakia system typically wear the Commonwealth's livery, which consists of blue and yellow hues that are hallmarks of the Ultima Segmentum's Armada Imperialis. As a badge of origin, the Solar Auxilia cohorts and the Armada detachments drawn from the Commonwealth bear the brazen bull of Manakia, except for those units that distinguish themselves to the degree that they were attributed their own heraldry. For the many armored cohorts and subcohorts the Commonwealth maintained, each vehicle's flank was adorned with colored stripes in the colors of the Commonwealth, alongside the gray-white dress commonly worn by vehicles attached to the Solar Auxilia. Due to the extreme interaction between the Solar Auxilia cohorts drawn from Manakia and those fleet elements stationed on Port Maw, it was fairly common to see units of Port Maw and the Ultima Segmentum Armada wearing the same colors. As a vital and highly industrialized star system, it was clear that the Manakian Commonwealth could sooner or later come under attack by the renegade Warmaster Horus's troops. However, in contrast to the more fractious Cyclops Cluster, the worlds of the Manakian Commonwealth were both better protected and more powerful. On one hand, the proximity between the Manakia system and Port Maw meant that the military and naval might possessed by these two worlds would readily be available to support each other and thus possess a threat to the War Master. On the other hand, the industrial and repair facilities of Port Maw's installations constituted an ideal stepping stone for Horus's march to Terra. The Cyclops Cluster, Horus's armies had benefited from the element of surprise. This would not be the case at Manakia, or indeed Port Maw, as several loyalist survivors, escapees from the massacre of Isfan V, had already spread the word of Horus's victory. Worst yet for the traitors, Port Maw was already rallying every available force to engage Horus's own war fleet. Fortunately for the traitors, a large portion of its fleet was already engaged elsewhere in a protracted and bloody battle against an orc space hulk. Other squadrons had also been dispatched to far-flung sectors under the War Master's orders, well before the Isfan III atrocities, and were struggling to reach their home port when Horus struck simultaneously at Manakia and Port Maul. The War Master had initially countless schemes and treacheries to ensure that when his axe fell, it would do so on the weakened and disoriented enemy. Horus's duplicity would culminate in the treachery at Port Maul whose outcome would deliver nearly the entire subsector into his hands. Manakia's planetary governor, Lord Protector Primus Beckett, died in the ruins of the Palace of Light, among the slaughterhouse that had become his command amphitheater. Defiant to the last breath, he stood before first captain Abaddon of the Sons of Horus, after the murder of his city, which had taken six solar days to die. Holding his ground, the brave Lord Protector offered the towering Astarte only words of rebuke before being casually brought down, crushed by the powered claw of the Sons of Horus' first captain, as a normal man would swat aside a fly. With the terrible fate of Hive Ilium to contemplate, the other Hive cities of Manakia quickly surrendered. Manakia became the first truly autonomous domain over which flew the Eye of Horus instead of the Imperial Aquila. Yet Horus did not rule there, nor did the bleak Primarch of the Death Guard, Mortarion the Reaper. The Manakian Commonwealth fell under the sway of Talok Thorn, a line captain of the Sons of Horus, whom the Ark Trader had installed to rule in his absence. Claiming the title of Tyrant of Port Maw, 
Talek Thorne would ensure that Manakia's industry and formidable workforce, but also the naval facilities at Port Maw, would now toil for the War Master. His seat of power was established in the bloody corridors and halls of the Triumph of Reason, Battlefleet Port Maw's former flagship, now aptly renamed the Lash, for it was under the cruel eyes and whips of Horus's overseers that Manakia was now placed. The former proud and spectacular hive cities became little more than gigantic slave camps. Talok had been given his own company as well. Six cohorts of the Solar Auxilia, drawn from the infamous Sithonian headhunters, recruited on the Sons of Horus homeworld, but judged unsuitable for a sturdy conversion to maintain order in the War Master's new dominion. And those were 40 facts on the three major human civilizations that resisted the Imperium. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. This isn't all of them. There's about five other ones that we're going to talk about in a later video. So subscribe to the channel, hit the little bell notification icon to stay updated, do all that junk. But also, um, the reason that I didn't include them in here is because those civilizations, they were a lot smaller. They were more um, nomadic and they also really didn't focus on their military. They were... They were different than the three that we just mentioned. So we'll talk about them in a later video. Um, but yeah, if you guys enjoy our content, thank our patrons on Patreon. It's because of them that we can do this. Link in the description if you guys want to support us. It's just a dollar a month. And with that dollar, we can create more videos for you guys. Thanks for listening. And I'll talk to you tomorrow. This was Gershwan with One Mind Syndicate signing out.